Wonderful song. Boy, that's got the gospel in it. Every stanza. All right, take your Bibles or your phone or whatever you have. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be finishing Colossians chapter 3 this morning. Colossians, many of you have containers in your shed or garage or someplace, fertilizer, weed killer, and it says concentrate on it. That means you get lots more than what's in it. Colossians 3 could easily have the word concentrate on it because Colossians 3 is a concentration of the Christian life. It's a consecrated version, or yeah, concentrated version of, of the Christian life. It began with our union with Christ. If you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Then it went down through. We're putting off the old, putting on the new. It kind of talked about the church there at the end of, uh, or before we got into the marriage, husbands, wives, and so on. Then it talked about marriage, and it talked about the family. And now, this morning, we're going to be talking about work. Life is made up mostly of work. Even with a standard 40-hour work week, you, if you live sort of a normal stretch of life, you'll have put in at least 100,000 hours in your lifetime. So, how does Christ's supremacy reveal itself in your work week? That's the question we're going to talk about this morning, the supremacy of Christ in your work. I want to read this passage, and we're going to pray and get into it. Starting in verse 22. Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Chapter 4, verse 1 finishes this section. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Great passage. I love these passages. Same thing over in Ephesians 6. A little bit more over there, but we're going to concentrate. It's a concentrated version of... Anyway, we're going to concentrate on this passage right here this morning. So pray with me, please. Father, thank you that we can come together. Lord, and here we are. We've sung. We've sung these wonderful praises and hymns to you. Lord, we thank you that you're our Redeemer, that you have given us that new heart by your spirit, that you have given us the gift of faith, those of us who are truly believers of repentance, placed us in your family, Father. We thank you for that. We thank you that we can sing of our Redeemer. Lord, we thank you for the word of God now. We pray that as we open this up and look at it and think about our own lives, Father, that your word would move powerfully in our hearts, that we would... We would uh, be open to the transforming power of the Word of God. And Father, we do thank you for each one who's here. We pray for any who may be visitors this morning. And we also pray for those who are uh, not here because they're not doing very well. We pray for Carlina, who's still in the hospital. We pray that you'll, Lord, encourage her heart. Don't let her be discouraged. And we pray for healing in her body there. And then I'm sure there's others that are going through uh, difficult times. And we pray that they might... Find in you, they're all in all, that their hope and trust is in you. So we commit our time now to you. In your name I pray, amen. I'm going to get him to sin within the first week. That's what Mitch said when he found out that a preacher was coming to work with him and his construction crew. He, they were building houses. I was the preacher. After pastoring for 13 years at another place, North Vernon, Indiana. I took a job painting and staining woods and trim for new homes, which lasted for about a year. It was one of the most interesting years of my life. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Mitch had no idea 
that I sin in some way every day without him provoking me. I got to love those pagans. They were great to work with. We could talk about stuff while we're doing stuff in the house, building it, talk about the rapture. They never heard of the rapture before. And so it was just a great time of uh, talking to those guys. But here's the thing. I knew that whether I was preaching or whether I was painting, I was serving the Lord. And that's what we're talking about this morning. Uh, you may have heard of the Protestant work ethic coming out of the Protestant Reformation. In the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church had priests and monks, and then they had the rest, the laity, which I don't particularly like that word, but they had the laity. The monks and the priests, they did the holy work. They were the ones serving God. The rest of the people, the grunts, you know, they just did work, secular work. It really didn't count for God. If they could bring some money, that would help, but it really didn't work. Uh, their work didn't really matter to God. And then came Martin Luther, John Calvin, and they discovered, Martin Luther especially at the beginnings, discovered the doctrine of justification by faith alone, which broke the chains from the Catholic Church. You didn't have to go to the Catholic Church and go to the priests to be justified or to hope you were justified, which they didn't even believe in justification by faith. Martin Luther taught justification by faith, that is by faith alone in Christ alone that we are declared righteous by God and accepted by God. And, and then out of that truth in the 1500s flowed the priesthood of the believer. Martin Luther, Calvin, they all believed in the priesthood of every believer. And Martin Luther said, and I want to quote to you here, um, if this truth that every, every believer is a priest and every occupation is sacred, he said, if this truth could be impressed upon the poor people, a servant girl would dance for joy and praise and thank God. So when I took that, when I took that year off from pastoring, people would ask me, so when are you getting back into the Lord's work? I would tell them confidently and boldly, Brother, I'm in the Lord's work. I'm painting and staining doors for the Lord. And that's true. That's a truth that we're going to see this morning. I'm staining doors for Jesus. Do you believe your work is sacred? Do you believe that what you're studying for matters to God? Like maybe you're, thank God for these people, studying biochemistry. I don't even understand algebra, let alone biochemistry, but anyway. Or maybe you're pre-law or an engineering major or economics or medicine or nursing or teaching. Or maybe you're working in sales. Maybe you're working in dentistry. God bless you if you are. <laughs> Law enforcement, roofing, plumbing, accounting, construction. You're working as an electrician in food services, painting. You know, and you know, that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. I'm talking to Christians right in here. When you go off to work or to school tomorrow morning, you are going off to serve your master, or as Todd Friel says, go serve your king. You've heard him probably say that. I love it. Maybe you're homeschooling, and maybe you're changing diapers every day a number of times. Go serve your king. This is all sacred work, and it matters to God. A couple of things before we dive into this passage. Number one, God prepared us to work, or God created us to work. He created us to be productive. No person so miserable as a lazy person. He put Adam in the garden to keep the garden. Have you ever seen a garden that was not kept? It didn't look very good. He, kept, he put Adam in that garden, and he told him to keep the garden. So even before the fall into sin, even before the fall into sin, God ordained work for all human beings. God didn't make us to be lazy or live off the government. Socialism is a curse to the human race. Free money from the government doesn't really help anyone. Frankly, no economic system has so elevated people out of poverty like the free market system 
and capitalism such as we have, which is a result ultimately, if you trace it back to the Protestant Reformation. God made us to work, to be productive. God said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, if you don't work, you don't eat. So if you're going to eat, you got to work. God, God said we should pray, give us this day our daily bread. But he did not mean that he was going to send parachutes of food to land in your backyard so that you could just go out there and grab the food. No. God filled your backyard with worms. And, but you've never seen a, worm, a, a robin out there laying on his back, <laughs> lazing around, waiting for a worm to crawl up into his beak and then eat it. Oh, no. You've seen those robins, man. They are busy. You know, they're not lazy. They are busy finding those worms. They're not lazying around. God made us to work and be productive. I want to real quickly, don't turn here, but I hope I can find it. There's so much in Ecclesiastes about work that is good. And let's see, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24. Just listen to this. This is good. Ecclesiastes 2, 24. There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. You work and you feel better. You're not lazy. You work and you eat and you drink the product of your labor. That's what the Bible says. And you feel better about it. You feel good when you fix something. Have you, if you're anything like me, yeah, okay, we got something to fix around the house. Usually it takes me five to six times longer if I ever actually get it done. We had one of these touch lamps in our bedroom. You know, it has three levels and it broke. It didn't work. So I found the little thing that you put in the base of it online. I nervously ordered it, and then I set aside a whole week to see if I could, <laughs> kidding on that part, but see if I could get this in there and took it all apart, and it's got wires going, and you're following the instructions and, you know, putting this stuff together. And then you got to tuck it all together because the base is only about that big. Tuck it all together and get it in there. Screw in the bulb, plug it in. Does it work or doesn't it work? Guess what? It worked. It worked. And it didn't take me nearly, I, you know what? I felt good about that. I just felt good about that. Now, I'm not fixing yours, so don't, <laughs> no. Don't call me on that one. But I felt good. God made us to be productive. Take a certain amount of humble pride in doing a good job, Ecclesiastes 2.24. Second issue I want to talk to you about before we get into this passage, and I'll try to be quick on this, but what about slavery? Because you'll notice that chapter, uh, that verse 22, the very first word is slaves. Now, what about slavery? What does the Bible teach about slavery? Uh, number one here, uh, I'm not advocating slavery here this morning, okay? And... That's been a horrendous thing, especially the trade, the slave trade. However, I do want to say this. Slavery has been around since the beginning of history. Almost all ancient civilizations, empires, built themselves up on the back of the labor of slaves. When you conquered a people, those people normally became slaves. The Roman Empire was full of slaves. I think they say about one in every three people that you'd meet in a Roman, city, a Roman city or a city in the Roman Empire would be a slave. Slaves were considered property of their masters. Um, and sometimes the masters were kind. Sometimes the masters were not kind. Even the, uh, even the law. Uh, there was one slave master, slave owner, and I don't remember his name. But I read about him it, around 64 AD, I believe it was. I think it was when Paul was in prison up there in Rome. But anyway, this, uh, this slave owner was murdered by one of his slaves. And the Roman Senate passed the bill, passed the, the uh, enactment, whatever. 400 of that man's slaves, this is 
that's all that he had, all 400 of those slaves were executed because one slave killed the master. 400 killed. Now, what does the Bible talk about? What does the Bible teach us about slavery? As far as was it right or was it wrong? Basically, it doesn't teach anything about whether it was right or it was wrong. Jesus Christ didn't come to directly change human institutions. He never marched against tyranny or campaigned against moral and social ills. He was not a social justice warrior. He never taught about the oppressed and the oppressors. He wasn't a proto-Marxist. Jesus Christ came into the world to save people from something far worse than slavery, human slavery, and that is spiritual slavery. He came to save people from the slavery of sin. Whether you were a slave in Paul's day or whether you are a CEO in our day, a multi-billion dollar company, you are a slave to sin, and your greatest need is for Christ to set you free. Martin Lloyd-Jones is spot on here, quote, the church's task primarily is to evangelize and to bring people to a knowledge of God. Then, having done that, she is to teach them how to live their life under God as his people. The church is not here to reform the world. Parentheses, when that becomes the purpose of the church, the church has lost the gospel, which is exactly what's happening in our day. The gospel is slipping away in the name of social justice. Martin Lloyd-Jones goes on here and he says, uh, let's see, where am I? The church is not here to reform the world, for the, wor for the world cannot be reformed. As long as the world is made up of sinners, there's going to be injustice in this world. There will never be a utopia brought in by human government into this world. So you put all that together and you, you realize that Paul sent uh, Onesimus back to Philemon, the book of Philemon, he sent him back and he told Philemon, look, I'm sending Onesimus, was it Onesimus? I think that's his name. I'm sending him back but more than your slave now, I'm sending him back as your brother. And that's the way it was in the first century church. You had masters and slaves gathering together for worshiping the Lord. Now, as time went on, as we well know, as the gospel began to penetrate cultures and societies and so on, we have in the 1800s, we had uh, Wilberforce who... Uh, and the slave trade was horrible. It was terrible. And Wilberforce came along and a parliamentarian, and, and he, they brought about the end of slavery, and we had a horrible civil war and uh, brought about the end of slavery, at least that slavery. The only problem is today, if you Google map of slavery on the world, in the world, the world is filled with slavery today of all kinds. And a lot of it's sex slavery, but there's other kinds of slavery too mining slavery, and so on. If you want to know more about slavery, listen to Thomas Sowell. He's not a Christian as far as I know, but he is brilliant in this whole area, and he, there's a two-hour YouTube. It's uh, on the real history of slavery. Sowell notes this about our country no other nation ended slavery in the same way and in so short a time as the United States did. And so we don't hear that. All we're hearing today is, are the horrors of slavery, which they were. But we don't realize that uh, we have come a long ways, but yet people are still enslaved to sin. And that's the biggest problem. And that's the message of the church. So we're not out marching as social justice warriors we're to evangelize, tell people the gospel. If masters get saved like Philemon, then he's going to treat his, his slaves or his workers, his employees, uh, better than the lost employer down the street. 
that you want to work for him, not for the guy down the street. But if your boss is an unsaved man, that's fine. You work for him. Okay, enough of that. God made us to work, to be productive. Slavery is a reality in the first century there, and the Bible doesn't have a goal of ending slavery. It has a goal of saving people from their sin. Now, what does God say to you and me as his people in this working world? What is, what is the biblical teaching as we go to work tomorrow morning, as you fulfill your responsibilities in your home or you head out to school, whatever you do to earn a living? And what I'm seeing here are five ways. I'm going to be rather quick about this, but five ways that we can exalt Christ in the working, in our working world. So number one is verse 22. By complete obedience. By complete obedience. There's no slaves here this morning. Praise the Lord. I'm glad I'm not a slave. By the way, you should thank God that you live in the times that you do. I don't know if you're familiar with the Barbary slave trade in the 16 and 1700s where Muslim pirates would land on the coasts of Europe and go into little villages and snatch people out of their beds. They, they, they say that there were a million Europeans sold as slaves into northern Africa in the 16, 1700s. I'm glad I didn't live then. I'm glad I live now. That's all only by the providence of God. Thank you, Lord. And I'm glad I wasn't an African uh, person and sold on those slave ships that brought them over to the Western world either. Praise God for that, that we're born here and we're thankful for that. Complete obedience. Slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Obey in all things. In all th I'm, I'm sure slaves in that day, just as you and I today, were tempted to argue over what our bosses want us to do. Well, that's dumb. I'm not doing that. Now, unless it's immoral, unless it's immoral, do it. That's what the Bible says. In all things, except for sin. Do it. If your boss listens to reason, reason with him. Thank God for him. I, working there in that construction for a year, I remember one day that we didn't have anything to do, but it had rained. There was mud along this, the, the new streets there in that little subdivision, and mud was in the, along the uh, curbing there. And so Wes said, well, why don't, you, why don't you shovel that mud out of there? And so for about five hours, shoveling mud, Felt like I was on a chain gang, you know, and I got pretty tired of doing that. Talked to Wes about maybe I need to go home, and he said, that's fine. But thank the Lord when you have reasonable bosses. Work with sincerity of heart. That's what it says in verse 22. Not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart not with external service as those who merely please men, not with slavery to the eye. In other words, not working when the boss isn't looking. You ever been in that situation? And then somebody is a forward observer. <laughs> He's coming. Everybody gets busy. That's what Paul's talking about right there. Eye servants. You know, you're only working when the boss is looking. My, uh, my, my construction guy, Wes, there, my boss, uh, I don't know anything about shooting transits and getting the lay of the land and whatnot, but there's a scope involved. And he would set up his apparatus over here with his scope, and he would spy on all the guys working. If you ever worked in construction, it's quite an interesting situation. Some of the most interesting characters, but he'd see and who's working and who's not working over there. Well, because they're working, they're eye servants. They work, or men pleasers. Only when the boss is looking. Paul says no. And he says with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Now, sincerity of heart means you're committed to doing the best job you can. Fearing the Lord means you know 
that God is keeping track of you. You go to work tomorrow morning, God is keeping track. You're accountable to God for what you do on Monday mornings. Your boss may not see you slacking off, milking the job, shopping on Amazon when you're supposed to be doing your work, but God does. Jonah Goldberg, who's a Jewish conservative author, he wrote uh, Suicide of the West. I don't think he's a Christian. As far as I know, he's not. But he said something profound. Listen to this. The notion that God is watching you, even when others are not, is probably the most powerful civilizing force in all of human history. Did you get that? That's amazing that he said that. I want to repeat that. The notion that God is watching you, even when others are not. By the way, this is good for kids. Even when mom or dad aren't watching. Okay, God's watching. And don't go into the table because God can see through tables. Okay. The notion that God is watching you, even when others are not, is probably the most powerful civilizing force in all of human history. Amazing. 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2 tells slaves there, and we're, once again, we're in a slave uh, economy. The whole system was slave and master. It's just the way it was back in that day. But 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2 says, Slaves, when you're working for a Christian master, make sure you give him even more obedience than if he wasn't a Christian. Sometimes... Christians are tempted to slough off if their boss is a Christian. Uh, he'll let me get away with it. Paul says, no, you even work harder so that the gospel is honored in the workplace. Number two, first of all, by complete obedience. Number two, wholehearted obedience. Whatever you do, verse 23, and this is a memory verse right here, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Now, that word heartily literally is from your soul, suke, from your soul. Do your work from your soul as for the Lord rather than for men. You are working for the Lord. Christ is your boss much more than men. Heartily, doing a good job, no shoddy workmanship. A Christian should not be guilty of shoddy workmanship. Have you ever hired someone to do something for you, and when it was all over, you're thinking, man, I'm not hiring that guy again. You know, we've had that situation. The guy was a Christian, and he just didn't want to do what we wanted him to do, and he didn't like us telling him either. Shoddy workmanship, no. You're serving the Lord from your soul, almost like worship. God says we are to work as if Christ was our boss, and he is. He inspects your work much more than your boss. So if you go to work thinking, you know, I need to do a good job because Christ is inspecting my work. When I was in seminary, I cleaned offices. It was fun. I cleaned an insurance office, dental office, and I cleaned a Chinese restaurant, which was really interesting because I, they, they would give me fried rice. I mean, fried rice. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. Wonderful people. But anyway, I, I remember, this was back in 77, 76. I remember thinking that I'm going to clean uh, this insurance company business uh, office. And I was thinking, you know, even though these people don't know what I'm doing because I'm there all by myself, I contracted with them. So I could have come in there and, you know, done a half-hearted job. And, but I thought to myself, you know, not that I'm the great person here, but Jesus is my inspector. He's the one who inspects. Man, that changes everything if you realize that. You're going to do a good job. You're going to do as best a job as you can. So... So Christ is our boss. You can tell your boss, sir, my goal here is to please you and do all I can to help you be successful, which is what an employee's goal should be humanly, to help their boss be successful. 
not just to take a paycheck. But I'm really working for someone else, and his name is Jesus Christ. This is going to make a huge difference in how we think about work. Your work, those 100,000-plus hours, and that's only 40 hours a week. Do the math, 20 to 70, let's say. That's uh, 50 years times 40 weeks times 50 weeks. You're going to come up with about 100,000 hours, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. I may be wrong on that, but... So you're, you're investing 100,000 hours of your life into working. And it all matters to God. As long as you are practicing integrity, honesty, faithfulness, truthfulness, your work is noble, no matter what you're doing. That servant girl in Luther's day, sweeping off the porch, you're a new creation in Christ, you're out there in the working world. You're making a difference in your work. Ephesians 4.28 says, you, you maybe used to be a thief. I bet all, well, I was a thief. I'll confess, I was a thief. Um, what would you steal? I'll tell you just a moment. Hang on. He who steals must steal no longer. Okay? Christ is your boss. He who steals must steal no longer. Stop taking that stuff from your workplace when the boss isn't looking after hour and you're sticking it in your trunk and you're taking it home. I worked in a hospital in Boston. We stole many a hospital towel. We just took them home. Stealing, it's pilfering. It's wrong. I was convicted this week because I'm doing this. You got to, whoa. Am I guilty? Sure enough, I was. Yesterday, I brought three pens back. <laughs> Those church pens, somehow or other, they just collect like dust on my desk at home. So, Actually, what you should do with those is hand them out to other people. It's got our church name on there. But you don't want to steal them. Performing, uh, uh, Ephesians 4.28 says, but rather he must labor, labor, work, performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. So you're working not just selfishly. It's fine you make a good salary. That's wonderful. You have a savings account. Good for you. You should. It's a wonderful thing. It's a good thing. But, all, but you also should be working to give. We're not just selfish here. We're giving. And so you give and you, you, you give to people that have a need or obviously in the church. So work from your soul as service to the Lord. No griping, complaining, slandering the boss. This is just common activity. This is a thing to do, you know, slandering the boss like all these other worthless employees that you're working with. Yeah. Uh, I remember sitting in a counseling setting with Dr. Smith up in Lafayette with a guy named Jim, and he couldn't hold his job. And as Doc Smith, who was a great guy, Doc Smith was an EW physician, but uh, he was a great counselor too, and he, pretty soon we found out, well, Jim thought his boss was too fat and too slow, and all, of his, all the other employees were too dumb, and painting was below his grade scale, plus he wasn't making enough money. Duh, I wonder why he couldn't keep a job, right? You say, well, my job is sheer drudgery. How do I honor God, work for Christ in my job? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I believe it's in his Ephesians commentary on Ephesians 6. He says this, quote, Say to yourself, I'm going to be a drudge for Christ's sake. Perhaps someone looking at me and seeing me enjoying the drudgery and doing it with finesse, and with a glamour and a glory that the world can never produce, may suddenly be convinced, convicted of sin, may become an inquirer after the way of salvation. Complete obedience, wholehearted obedience, Christ-pleasing obedience. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. I mean... The same thing is throughout this whole passage. You're, li you're working for God, no matter what you're doing. Now, 
He's talking to slaves, remember? He's talking to slaves. Slaves were property of their masters. They were property. They owned nothing. And they received little or no compensation. They were fed. And they certainly received very little appreciation. Everybody likes to be appreciated, right? You like it when your boss gives you high marks. Everybody like Slaves didn't get appreciated. John Calvin says this. Listen to this. He says, The world puts little value on the labor of slaves, quote, but God esteems them as highly as the duties of kings. I hope you heard that. The world puts no value on the work of a slave, but God esteems them as highly as the duties of kings. Your 100,000 hours matters to God. Paul says, from this verse, you'll receive the reward of the inheritance. This world's not your home. You may have nothing here or little. You may not own a home. By the way, Tom Cruise is wanting to sell his $40 million home and tell you, right? So you might want to check it out. Could a Christian buy a $40 million home? As long as he's giving to the Lord and he's treating his employees well, I don't see a problem with it. It's probably not going to happen, but anyway, Paul says, remember, this world is not your home. Rather have almost nothing in this, now I'm talking to us, not slaves, but us. Rather have almost nothing in this world for 60 or 70 years and die and inherit, and inherit a glorious reward because you knew Christ, you loved Christ, you served him every day rather than having billions of dollars to your name and dying without Christ and going to hell. Think about that. You may not have much in this world, but you're living for Christ. And you may not be able to do much. There are some people that, you know, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, whoever is not willing to work, you may not be able to do much, but you're willing. God sees that. And you have a rich inheritance, says this verse right here. It's wonderful. So whatever you do every day, drilling holes in sheet metal or cleaning people's houses, you are drilling and cleaning for eternity. You are not living under, in the Middle Ages where the priests do God's work and the other people just do the mundane work that doesn't really count for eternity. No, we're all priests. We're all every day living for Christ. Now, your work matters to God. Let's add this in at this point. Yes, good, we have time for this. What about retirement? Doesn't the Bible say that when you reach a certain age, you can retire and just kick back and watch Andy Griffith shows all day? You know, just be a pain to your wife? She's thinking, why don't you get out there and do something? Did you see the backyard? You need to get out there and clean that up. What about retirement? I read about a barber. You may have read about this guy. Got my attention. This was a couple years ago. I read about him then. Anthony Mancinelli from New Windsor, New York. He said, quote, I advise a lot of people not to quit working, end quote. He was still cutting hair at 107 years of age, 40 hours a week. Wow. I wish he'd be a Christian. And heart grieves for some of these people like, Jonah Goldberg and Dennis Prager and Ben Shapiro. He just, man, these guys, I wish they'd come to Christ. Mr. Man Mancinelli died a couple years ago. He was 108 in 2019. That's when he died. You looking forward to retirement when you can kick back and do nothing? We have a Psalm 90, verse 10 man in our midst. 
I won't call him out by name, but most of you will know this. But he's at the 80 mark, Psalm 90, 10. Some go to 70, some go to 80. He's at the 80 mark. He spends his days out in his shop, out in his shop, working on high-end furniture legs. He's still doing it. And I imagine he'll do it as long as he can. For the Lord. We're recalling Dan Jost back. He's been down there in Florida long enough. Right? Absolutely. But I told Dan I had him in my message this morning. You know, Dan retired a few years ago. I don't think he's ever been, he deserves a Florida break. I don't think he's ever been busier. Do you know how many decks that man has built? Do you know how much of what has happened in this church in the last three months is the result of Dan's influence? There's a good example, again, of a man using his retirement for the Lord. So God help us, those of us who are, you know, I'll be 60s pretty soon. Well, no, I'll be, no, I'll be 80 pretty soon. <laughs> Some of you are getting close to that. What are you thinking about doing? You think you're going to just kick back, you know, like... Spend your days doing nothing. No, you're not going to do that. You'll be miserable. Lazy people are miserable. There's always something to do, right? There's always something that you can There's somebody that you can go help. Clean their gutter out or rake their leaves or something that you can do. Number uh, three, I believe it is. I get to keep moving here. Uh, by Christ-pleasing obedience, verse 24. No, did I already? I already did that one. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. We're at the enduring obedience, verse 25. Now here, uh, there are nasty people out there in that work jungle. Some of you have met them. Sometimes they're fellow workers. Sometimes they're bosses. Nasty people who treat people nastily. That's what this verse is for right here. Let me read it. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Now, we know God's in charge. He's sovereign. Everything that happens to us is for our good, for his glory. So God is going to let some of us uh, work with nasty people. God's going to let us do that. He's going to let us be under... Nasty bosses. First Peter chapter 2 talks about the boss that doesn't treat you well. Joseph, a great worker. Mrs. Potiphar lied about him, sent him to jail. The cupbearer forgot all about Joseph for two years. Here's the thing. What Paul is saying, what God is saying here, and we endure obedience regardless of what's going on. No one gets away with injustice. That's what Paul is saying here. He who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. God will exact justice without partiality. God doesn't care what the color of your skin is. He doesn't care how many degrees you have behind your name or that nasty person, he will exact justice. Like Virgil and Daryl said, there may be injustice today, and you're never going to find a world until Jesus comes back where there is perfect justice. There may be injustice today, but those two guys, some of you know them, said that doesn't mean there's non-justice. There will be justice. And there have been some horrendous things done by human beings against one another. And they seem to have gotten away with it. But they didn't. And they won't. And that's what Paul is saying here. He who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done. And that without partiality. It doesn't matter how many billions of dollars that guy is worth. He's going to pay. Now, we know that none of us are innocent. We're all guilty. 
praise God, Christ received the consequences of our wrong in that verse. All our wrongs were judged in him on that cross for which we give thanks. But no one gets away with injustice. Finally, by mutual obedience, and that means both the slave and the master must obey God. Both the employee and the employer must obey God. That's what Paul is saying. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. It's interesting. I'm sure this was shocking when these people read this, that Paul doesn't overlook the masters. He reminded Philemon that his slave Onesimus was now a brother, and he told him he must treat him kindly. You may be a master, you may be an employer, but you have a master in heaven. Treat your employees well. Thank God for every Christian man or woman who invests in a business. Here's free market. Here's capitalism. And I'm tired of people talking down the American system. It has done more good for people than any other nation in the world. And we're thankful for our country. But thank God for every Christian employer, Christian man or woman who starts a business and then hires people to help them succeed at that business and then they pay their employees rightly and so on. Praise God for that. They too have a master in heaven. All right. Complete obedience, wholehearted obedience, Christ-pleasing obedience, enduring obedience, and mutual slave and master obedience. Too many Christians fail to practice the supremacy of Christ in their daily work. They really don't believe it. You think you're just going off to that drudgery job. Remember Martin Lloyd-Jones. You are a priest, and you are serving the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And like Todd Friel says, go serve your king tomorrow morning when you take off for work or school or whatever you go to remember you are going to serve the king and your work matters to God if you're here and you're not a Christian we want you to know that you're not going to work your way to heaven work matters to God but you can't work your way to heaven by grace are we saved through faith. That's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Christ paid the penalty for sin on that cross. Bow your heart. Trust him as your savior. And then realize that when you go to work, you're working for the king. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for how your word digs right into where we live, these 100,000 plus hours of work that we, we do. And whatever our situation is, Lord, what we do matters to you. And Lord, I do pray that you'd be honored through all of our lives, Lord. Pray for those who are maybe not able to work. That's fine. You know that. You know the situation. And Lord, but Lord, we pray that you'll bless them. Thank you for our time. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we finish our service together.